Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel. I'm so glad you've joined me tonight. I love all my listeners and welcome, welcome to the show. I've got a lovely story to you tonight, all the way from Canada, and it's the Lake Superior Bigfoot Encounter. So let's get started. Dear Sarah and all your listeners, my Bigfoot Encounter happened when I was going to stay with my sister at her home in British Columbia. I was an uninvited guest because I, want, I wanted to arrive unannounced and unexpected. You see, my sister's was expecting a baby and she was planning to have a home birth and I wanted to be there for her. I was not happy at all about her wacky home birth decision. I knew things could go wrong, but she assured me that she had a great midwife who would be on hand to help her during the delivery. I really want you to give birth at ho- I really want to give birth at home, she told me, and I've even got a birthing pool. I could tell by her tone that she was very excited and I knew when my sister wanted to do something, wild horses weren't going to stop her. A birthing pool, I asked in horror. It's way too cold in winter to be giving birth in water. I'm not sure it's a good idea, sis. You sound like my gynaecologist, she laughed. <laughs> He's dead set up against the idea and he wants me to be in hospital for the delivery. He says at my age I'm at a greater risk for medical complications. You are 42, I scolded. You're not a spring chicken anymore. You really need to listen to the doc, sis. I am terrified you could lose the baby. My sister laughed. (laughs) You sound just like Dennis, she said. Dennis was her husband, of course. My poor husband, he's freaking out. Anyone would think that he was the one about to give birth to this baby. Well, it is a joint thing, I said to her. Maybe for Dennis's sake, you should have the baby in hospital, just for his peace of mind. Stop being such a drama queen, my sister snapped. This is my body, my baby, and my choice. It'll be fine, she reassured me. Dennis will make sure the birthing pool is nice and warm for me. My sister had a beautiful house with stunning views and huge fireplaces with crackling fires in winter. Part of me understood her longing to be in a cosy home while giving birth, but it all seemed like a crazy idea to me. I then phoned my buddy, Ralph. Fancy a break, I asked him. Who doesn't, he said. Somewhere warm and sunny, I hope. The weather here is freezing. No chance, I said. How about an icy road trip around Lake Superior? Sounds pretty dangerous, he laughed. What the hell, he said. It'll be an arctic kind of adventure. And you know me. Adventure is my middle name. Megan is having her baby at home. And it is due any day now. And I could do with your help, I told him. A home birth, he asked. Isn't that a preposterous idea, given her age? It gets worse, I told him. She's going to use a birthing pool. I could hear him pausing at the other end of the line. Let's not kid, he said. Your sister can be a little on the eccentric side. Is Megan agreeable with me helping out, he asked. She will have to be, I told him. She is lucky that I have a buddy that's a gynaecologist. And I need you to come along for my own peace of mind. I'm very scared about this birth. So there you are. Those are the reasons I was driving down the Trans-Canadian Highway in February in my Hyundai all the way from Toronto, where I lived, to my sister's beautiful home in British Columbia. I had all the weather, all weather tyres on my car, as well as all the essentials, like battery starters, a shovel, plenty of warm clothes, and loads of snacks for the journey. I had seen the breathtaking beauty of Lake Superior in summer. But in winter, it was so magical. It was like a beautiful winter wonderland. I could see that some parts of the lake were frozen over with ice and then there were pretty little icebergs floating around in the water like miniature little islands. The weather was freezing and the conditions were fierce and hazardous. We had been driving through some nasty blizzards and snowstorms in the early hours of the morning. Luckily light was now dawning over the horizon. Parts of the journey had been extremely treacherous. 
We even had a near miss with a lorry that nearly went sliding backwards into my Hyundai. Luckily, I managed to manoeuvre my vehicle out of the way in the nick of time. The winds had finally down, died down and the visibility had improved exponentially, so I thought the journey would be plain sailing from now on. But was I wrong? You bet. The roads looked beautiful as they were all coated with thick snow like white frosting on a Christmas cake. But just as I thought things were improving, the road became slippier, slipperier and slipperier. A distance away up a slight hill, I saw a car with its hazard warning lights on, and I saw that it was not moving. I wondered if it was stuck in the heavy snow. I parked my car, and suddenly the lady from the car in front stepped out of her car, wrapping her scarf over her neck and running towards us. She tapped on my window, and I rolled it down. Hi there, she said. We are well and truly stuck, I'm afraid. I would not advise you going any further until the snowplow comes. There's been a ghastly accident further down the road and the driver didn't make it, sadly. I really wouldn't advise you taking any risks in your car, not at the moment, or you'll be skidding and sliding all over the place. It's not worth taking chances with the road this icy. I agree, I said. We watched the lady darting back into her car while I put on some good music and Ralph and I started drinking lovely warm cups of coffee out of my thermos flask. Suddenly against the white snow, we saw two dramatic large black forms moving quickly. Look at that, said Ralph. Aren't bears still hibernating at this time of year? What on earth are they doing in the snow? In February of all times. Those are not bears, I said. We were surprised to see the creatures venture closer, so close, in fact, that they almost brushed against my Hyundai in front of us. What on earth are they, gasped Ralph, looking amazed. I've never seen creatures like that before. The two creatures were massive in size and girth, and you could really be forgiven for misidentifying them as a larger grizzly bear. The biggest creature was about nine foot tall, while the other creature, which I assume was female, was marginally smaller at about seven. Their hair was matted and thick, and it covered the whole body, almost resembling shaggy dog coats. The arms were very long, and they had large hands and fingers like a man. Then I noticed there was a small creature tethered to the mother's belly. It must have been her little sprog, I thought. The creature looked at us with curious brown eyes, which reminded me of a monkey. It was then that the father turned his head in our direction and looked directly at us, and he snarled like a dog does when he is threatening to fight you. In that moment, I felt more terror than I had felt all this time driving through those hazardous snowstorms. If looks could kill, then that was a killer look if I ever saw one. The female, on the other hand, was benign in her expression and looked at us with more curiosity than venom. But you could see the big one was ex extremely protective. The faces were almost like primitive man, with flat noses, thin lips and brown big eyes. The way those creatures crossed that icy road was with effortless ease, because a human would be slipping all over the place. It was like these large hairy feet were like snowshoes. Within seconds, they had vanished out of sight. I ran over to the young girl's car, and I knocked on the window, and she slid it down. Are you all right? I asked. She looked as white as a sheet. I can't believe what I've just seen. I think we've seen Bigfoot, she said. I didn't even know they were real. I've never seen anything like them before. Have you? This is quite some day, I said. Then she continued to tell me, I have a patient who's having contractions at the moment. I'm her midwife. Can you believe it? She's insisting on having her baby in a birthing pool in weather like this, of all things. I gave her a big, knowing smile. That would be my sister, I said. But I come armed with superior tools, I said, pointing to my car. You see that man over there in the calf? Well, he's a gynaecologist. He's my friend, too. The girl did look relieved. I was a little worried about this one, given your sister's age. Boy, she is a stubborn one. That would be her, I confirmed, stubborn as hell, 
Been like that since the day she was born. Well, to cut a long story short, the midwife, Ralph, and I arrived at my sister's house in the nick of time, just as she was pushing out the most perfect little baby girl into the warm water of the birthing pool, which was situated close to the coziest crackling fire that you had ever seen. The baby let out a huge cry, and we weighed it, and she weighed seven pounds and two ounces. See, laughed my sister. I told you the birth would be a breeze. It was perfect. As a gynaecologist, this will be a day I will never forget. But perfect would not be the only word I would use, said Ralph. The midwife, Ralph, and I gave each other a knowing look. This day was one of a kind, and not just because of the birth, and we all knew that. So there you are. I hope you enjoyed my story. Thank you so much for such a wonderful story and to all my listeners for listening. Until next time, good night.